Hello. The purpose of this video is to talk about sponsorship and partnership. So here we go. So first of all, what is sponsorship? The nice formal definition is the acquisition of rights to affiliate or directly associate with a product or event for the purpose of deriving benefits related to that affiliation. Now that's a big fancy sounding definition. Um, basically that means you associate your name um, with another product or event. Um, for example, um, the arts festival sponsored by GEICO. Um, you know, GEICO would provide something in, in exchange for being affiliated with that event. So why do we want sponsorship? Well, ideally it's a win-win situation um, and it works. So one organization is going to get money or services or in-kind donation. Um, the other one's going to get their name associated with something, and we know from research that um, it's quite effective. For example, um, research tells us that sponsors of youth sports teams um, have a more favorable rating with those youth sport participants. It works for both. So here's just a little game to play about sponsor matching. So on the left is sponsors. On the right is who they sponsor. So if you just want to take a minute, and I will pause here um, and take your guesses of who sponsors who. Okay, so let's reveal the answers. So McDonald's um, is a sponsor of the Junior Jazz. So McDonald's is a good target audience for McDonald's, Junior Jazz. It's youth, youth like McDonald's. Um, so it's a good fit for McDonald's. For Junior Jazz, eh, it's, it's an income source. However, you might question if the image of McDonald's, um, you know, this image here, um, is a good fit for a program that's ideally promoting healthy youth living. Um, Miller Lite is a sponsor of the Tour of Utah, so the bike race. Uh, Wells Fargo is a sponsor of Eve Salt Lake. So Eve Salt Lake is a New Year's celebration, very family-friendly uh, type celebration. Uh, Wilson, which is a sporting goods company, is a sponsor of the U.S. Open tennis event. Um, in this case, Wilson provides all the tennis balls uh, for the tournament. So they're not actually giving money necessarily, just the tennis balls. The original Creamy's Premium Ice Cream is a sponsor of the Salt Lake City Marathon. Specifically, they're a sponsor of the one mile fun run for kids. So again, um, kids, ice cream, here's the fit. Um, I'm gonna skip Walmart for a second and go to Jamie Mitchell Auto Sales. You probably don't know who this is, um, but they are a sponsor of Nash County Parks and Recreation. I, I picked that just um, to say Jamie Mitchell sounds like a very local business, so probably very local business sponsoring local parks and recreation. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm gonna skip Walmart, I have Walmart pointing to Wasatch Community Gardens. In fact, Walmart is not um, a sponsor of Wasatch Community Gardens, although they did approach um, the gardens in, about sponsorship, and Wasatch Community Gardens actually turned them away because they did not think the image of Walmart matched uh, what they were trying to do. Their mis mission and image of community gardens, healthy living, small community based programs. So that leads us to kind of how do you decide who your sponsors are? So, one way, and we alluded to this, is Image. Is there an image match? And I be still in junior jazz already because I don't think this, you know, junior jazz image, healthy living, active lifestyle is a good match um, with McDonald's. However, for McDonald's, this is a good target audience match. You know, McDonald's wants kids, um, so for them it's good. Uh, is there a mission fit or is there a contradiction in mission? So these are all things you're going to want to consider. So here's some examples of good fits. So Canon, the camera company here, is a sponsor of Little League Baseball. Little League Baseball, you know, parents taking pictures. Also, U.S. Open Tennis, again, people taking pictures. Subaru is a sponsor of U.S. Skiing. Subaru trying to get this image of this car that goes in snow, kind of the hardy car, right? Um, and then Cream of Wheat Cereal here is a sponsor of the National Park Service. So if you think about the image of Cream of Wheat Cereal, you might think camping, you might think, you know, granola, um, a little more rough. Uh, outdoorsy, so this is a good image fit. I also have a picture here of Altoids. Um, you can think for a second what Altoids might be a good sponsor of. Um, in fact, they tend to sponsor a lot of arts organizations. Why? 
um, people popping their Altoids um, instead of chewing gum or unwrapping cameras or unwrapping candy during the performance. So let's move on to partnerships and privatization. So when we talk about partnerships and privatization in this context, um, we're really talking about <coughs> government agencies um, who then partner and privatize. Um, can you have a partnership that's not through, through a government agency? Absolutely. Um, but in this case, we're talking about through a government agency. So why would we consider partnering and privatizing? One is this general attitude that government sucks. We see this kind of in the Tea Party adit, Tea Party movement. Um, people think just government's bad. They think government has too much bureaucracy. It's inflexible. It has no incentive to improve, and it's wasteful. Um, having worked in government, I can confirm that some of this is true. I think the image is a little unfair, but uh, there is a lot of bureaucracy, in that, and that can make things inflexible and at times wasteful. Um, the alternative is this idea that private enterprise rules, that it's efficient, that it has specialized resources, it's a higher quality, um, and what we call the hedgehog principle, uh, which is basically an organization that specializes in something and does that one thing exceptionally well, is going to be better at doing it than an organization, aka the government, who does a ton of things. Um, having also worked in private enterprise, I can say that some of these things are true, but not always true. Um, so this kind of, you know, total all or nothing attitude is somewhere the reality exists in the middle and in general there's an overall shift in the attitude of government should be a facilitator of service not just a direct provider and I always just look for an excuse to use this slide quite frankly so why would we not um, have a partnership or privatization um, bottom line I think is summed up here in our little cartoon it's complicated um, you have less control as a government provider over the program. You have potential for rising costs because you have less control. Um, there's lack of public accountability because you have less control. Um, and it still does require staff time from the government side to manage those relationships. Uh, there's also some accusation that it's unfair who gets those contracts, who gets the partnerships, um, and how is that determined. The big picture here, a question you always want to ask yourself, um, is does a partnership help you achieve your mission. Um, and if it does, then go for it. If it doesn't, then think twice about it. So when we talk about privatization, uh, we talk about a continuum from direct provider to privatization on the other end. So direct provider, and again, we're talking about government services, uh, means that the government does everything. So if we're talking about a youth basketball program, for example, uh, the government would hire the officials, book the gyms, do all the league scheduling, all that in-house. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum is privatization, and this would be the government saying, um, we don't believe youth basketball should be a government program, we're going to just let private providers provide it, we're getting out of that business, um, we're out of it. Um, most things tend to exist somewhere on the continuum here, although there's certainly plenty of services and recreation that are direct provisions of the government. So I think the best way to describe things that go on in the mess of this continuum is to give some examples. So this is the Kettler Capitals Iceplex. It is in Arlington, Virginia. Um, it is the ice rink and practice and office home of the NHL team, the Washington Capitals, just their practice facility. Uh, it was actually built rather creatively on top of a parking garage and a shopping center in Arlington, Virginia. You see the sketch here. The deal here is Arlington County, so the government built the facility. Okay, it cost them $30 million. They built the facility with the idea and always the agreement that the Capitals would lease the facility. They signed a 30-year lease, um, and the Capitals would run the facility. Now, Capitals are running programs, um, learn to skate, youth hockey, all those types of things. Um, they're making revenue off this, off this government-built facility. However, they're using that revenue to pay back the county the lease. Um, the other part of this is they're providing a recreational service for the county. They're providing skate programs uh, that were not previously there. So this is probably more on the private end of the spectrum, but certainly a um, provider government element. Another thing you can do is simply contract out your operations. Uh, so in Arlington County, which is where I worked for a while, um, we used to run our tennis programs as direct providers. We'd hire the instructors, buy the balls, uh, do all the oversight, etc. Uh, 
At the time, we offered about 30 classes a week, had an annual revenue of $60,000, annual expenses of around 65. You can do that math very simply. It was not the best situation. Um, and, you know, our kids were bored. Now, one of the things with tennis, um, and this goes back to the accusation of government being inflexible, is there's a market rate for instructors. Uh, however, there are certain government regulations about um, what you can pay, and that was below market rate for instructors. So we had trouble getting in-house good instructors. Uh, also because, you know, we were one program that wasn't full-time, we were relying on part-time staff. So what we did, um, we hired a company, um, First Serve Tennis Academy, to run, that's my dog, <laughs> to run our tennis programs. Um, this company was able to pay market rate for the instructors, because we're hiring the company, not the instructors. Um, so they're paying, able to pay market rate for the instructors. Also, because they had contracts with many different um, government agencies in the areas, they were allowed, um, or they were able to give instructors full-time work because it would work some in Arlington, some in Vienna, uh, and elsewhere. So here's the results of that. They would provide the programming. Um, the county provided registration and marketing for the classes and a staff person to kind of just assist. Um, we did put quality measures and price controls um, in the contract. So I alluded to the, um, the fact that one of the concerns with privatization is the risk of rising costs or the risk of poor quality. Uh, well, this is how we addressed it. We put it in the contract that cost had to stay at a certain level and quality had to stay at a certain level as measured by evaluation. Otherwise, they would lose the contract. Um, the company, First Serve Tennis Academy, provided all the services and related expenses. So um, that includes tennis balls, awards, of course, all the staff. Okay. Um, the way we paid them was a revenue split. Uh, they received 75% of the revenue, the county received 25% of the revenue. So four years later, here was the situation. We were up from 30 classes to 60 classes. Um, we added programs, team tennis, socials, play days, tournaments. Um, overall participation tripled. Revenue went from 60000 to 150000 um, Expenses went way up too, but now that you do that math, we're now making 38.75 um, instead of losing 5000 we also had higher quality services, we won some awards, um, consistently high reviews, everybody's having fun. So this is a great example um, of a place where it worked, you know. Uh, our contract worked. Another example, and people often are not aware that um, government has this power, is what's called an exaction. So when people do construction above and beyond a certain level, they have to get a permit. Um, and the government can put, you know, whatever conditions on that permit that they would like. So in this case, um, there's a big country club in Arlington, Army Navy Country Club. It tends to get, like, their generals and stuff who work in the Pentagon. Um, they wanted to build a nice new clubhouse. Here's the sketch of it. Arlington also has great, great, fantastic bike trails covering most of the county. However, there's a gap in the bike trails, and it was happened to be because the country club got in the way. So when the country club came to Arlington County and said, hey, we want to build this clubhouse, the county said, great, you can do that in exchange for letting us run the bike trail through the golf course. Um, the club eventually agreed. They got their nice new clubhouse, um, and now the bike path literally runs right through the golf course and allows bigger access to the county. Another example from Arlington is what's called affiliated sports groups. So uh, for our youth programs, we did a combination of direct programming for our youth basketball um, and then partnerships. We recognized that uh, youth sports programming was part of our mission. It was important, but we also recognized that we were not always the most efficient um, provider of it. So we made agreements with nonprofit organizations, Little League Baseball, Arlington Soccer, Arlington Youth Football, Arlington Girls Softball, Arlington Lacrosse. Um, these nonprofit organizations ran those programs in exchange. They got priority field space. Um, they got assistance from a county staff member. They got discounted field rental rates. Um, so they were getting a sweet deal. They were running their program, and we were still able to provide um, a service that was part of our mission. Okay, so that wraps up our partnerships and sponsorships lecture.